Rock Eyes would like to welcome Jeff Westlake Hydrogen. Hey, man, what's up? What's going on? Ah, uh, not a whole lot, man. How you doing? Uh, I'm uh, feeling a little bit better. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's good. That's yeah. good. So, um, um, you know, we've been covering the band, you know, pretty long now. I think, you know, almost every release we did a review or whatever, and uh, we became friends and stuff like that. Um, let's go back to the very early days and stuff uh, from uh, Best Served with Volume, uh, which came out, I guess, in 2004. When you, when you first started getting into music and, and decided, you know, that's the direction that you wanted to go, was there anything else besides music that you really wanted to do? No, to be honest with you, I mean, it's it, it, been music since I was a really, really, really little kid. I mean, um, I can remember back uh, when I was a little kid until I was about five, I lived with my grandparents um, predominantly, and there was always music in the house, and as a very little kid, like three years old, I got my first guitar, and, you know, and just one thing progressed from here to there, and, and, and but music has always been there. I mean, you know, I went to school, and and to college and got a job working with, uh, started out in the restaurant field, uh, ended up working, um, you know, my way up through that and doing things like that. But ultimately I still played music. I still was interested in music. Um, and then in, uh, uh, geez, probably 1999, I decided to make, start making the change going full time music. And so since 99, that's what I've been doing. Cool. Now, now, how difficult um, back then compared to what it is today? I, I know I get like 200 downloads a day, you know, plus um, to break into music at, at this time. Well, you know, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, there's no question it's tough. I, I happen to be fortunate uh, in the fact that, you know, I ended up meeting meeting Julie Eflin, which is now Julie Westlake, my wife, and the front person for Hydrogen. And um, she made a huge difference in things just because of what she brought to the table for her voice, her talent, uh, her looks, her marketability, um, you know, all those things. And, I, you know, and, and back when Hydrogen started out, there wasn't... Uh, in this moment and hailstorm and all those things. I mean, we were kind of like a, a forerunner at that time. At that time, the only thing that was really going on female wise on a consistent, consistent basis was Doro. Right. Uh, you know, and then we came out about the same time that Veronica and Pete and Benedict and got together and started coming out. So together, you know, we kind of were the forerunners of what's now going on and on and on and on and, and it's doing really well. Um, but, you know, I think we both got lucky in the sense that, you know, we had really, really dominating, hey, I'm not giving you a chance not to look at us front persons in Veronica and Julie. Right. Um, you know, and that made things a lot easier for us to break in, you know, and the, the, the thing for us um, that really helped us, though, outside of the band was Michael Wagner, was Michael, um, us getting on his radar and ended up working with him, you know, having his name attached to what we were doing with the Bombshell record after, you know, Best Service Volume um, was the thing that really kind of broke us. And, and a little funny, funny side story to that, too. When we were doing Bombshell, Veronica had come to meet Michael. She had become friends with uh, Gabby and Wolf Hoffman, um, where Michael's studio was in Nashville on their property and from Accept, of course, and she actually came to visit Michael, so I don't know if there were talks about them doing a record with him, and then it just, you know, fell apart or whatever, but um, I remember them coming in the studio, and we didn't even talk. I just remember seeing him talking with Michael and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, he definitely made a huge difference in Hydrogen. Cool. Cool. Now, even from the early days, you were endorsed by Pepsi for the first uh, Best Serve with Volume. So so you really had a, a pretty good jump start uh, right from the beginning, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and again, again, those things, you know, came as a direct result of Julie. Right. Um, her marketability and, and her just her personality. Anybody that's ever met or talked with Julie. You know, right. you hear this girl with this really powerful voice, and this, and she's got this very dominating look, you know, in the photos and all that stuff. She's a very down-to-earth person. You wouldn't meet a nicer person. Right. Um, 
You know, and that stuff helped, you know, Pepsi got on board again. We didn't go looking for Pepsi. Pepsi came and found us. Right. Um, and next thing I know, we're shooting videos and we're, you know, we're going to a NASCAR races uh, in front of a quarter of a million people and, and uh, on the smash bus doing stuff with them and doing, you know, commercials for them, filming commercials. Julie was in a commercial spot for them for the Northeast region. Um you know, and that really helped out a lot. Well, that thing helped lead to Budweiser jumping on board and off the rim NASCAR apparel jumping on board and um, a bunch of other things. So, you know, it's it's very, what, what am I trying to say? It, it's, you can't hide the Julie factor. Now, granted, we were writing the music and all that stuff and we were putting everything together and making it happen, but anybody... Uh, that was associated with the band or in our little clique at that time, you know, they would be silly to tell you anything other than she made the whole thing run. She was what made people want to jump on board and do the things, you know, that they did to help us out and, and help make Hydrogen a success. So um, Pepsi, Budweiser, Off the Rim, um, and there were a little, you know, and then Julie ended up getting clothing endorsements. Um, in Europe, and we, you know, got some other things going on in Europe too that helped us over there. It, it all was just a direct result of her, and then us being able to take advantage of, of what she was in the band and being able to parlay it into success. Right, right. I, I mean, you know, she's definitely eye candy, and and man, when you when when you see that bombshell uh, uh, cover, I mean, you, you can't help but not stare. You know, <laughs> and, and oh yeah, and also yeah. that 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 photo when she's got that long black coat on and she got the kiss shirt on. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a fantastic promo shot right there. You know, but when Bombshell came out and that front front cover, you know, hit the market and was all over like Facebook or whatever you want to call it, the media. Um, people definitely would check out the band no matter what. You know, so uh, well, it was it was really good. You know, and, and that that whole thing. Uh, the bombshell cover, we, we went and shot with John Scarpati at Michael Wagner's urging. And Scarpati has shot all the big names. He's like one of the biggest photographers in, in, in the business. And he lived in Nashville, too, at the time, and he still does. And we went and shot with him. Now, the funny thing about it was we had a specific look. Michael came up with the album title, Bombshell. Right. And, and the whole idea that Michael and Julie came up with was like a rock and roll Marilyn Monroe. So we went out and we found a uh, wardrobe that would kind of appeal to that. You know, nothing, you know, every time somebody thinks about Marilyn Monroe, they think about her in the white dress or the van and, right. and, and all that stuff. But, we, you know, we knew we couldn't go that route because this is rock and roll. You know, this is this is rock. So we had to keep the coloring, you know, dark. And, and so we went out and found that outfit and, Julie had brought a bunch of different things in at Scarpati's request, and and the cover, the the original cover of Bombshell, where she has squatted down, was the absolute last photo taken of a two day run, and he just wanted her to do that just so he could have something to pick from, and that ended up being what was put on the uh, Bombshell cover. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool, you know. And now, 2008, Deadly Passion came out, and uh, you had Jeff Young from Megadeth uh, come in and do some guitar work, and uh, that didn't work out as planned. So, what happened? Well, actually, in 2008, in 2008, Deadly Passion came out, and we and we had Craig Goldie come in. Jeff didn't come in until 2010. Right. Uh, Craig had come in. You know, when when uh, we were on tour over in Europe doing the last legs of the Bombshell World Tour, or actually it was the second Finn World Tour, uh, I received an email from Craig Goldie talking about, you know, the band and this, that, and the other. And so I didn't respond to him while we were over there just because the Internet's a horrible thing to try to keep a good signal with in Europe. Right. Um, so when I got back, you know, I emailed him, and we ended up talking, and, and he had interest in joining the band. Well, at that time, Craig didn't have anything going on because Ronnie had gone back to Sabbath. Right. Uh, and started doing the D.O. years and started started the tour uh, for that, uh, what was eventually become Heaven and Hell. But so we talked, and we ended up bringing Craig out to Kentucky to write. He joined the band, put together a press release for it, you know, put out the heat, you know, he was joining and came out and, 
um, he was here, I don't know, almost three weeks, and we wrote, um, and then he went back to California because he had, you know, he had some other obligations and all that stuff, and, and we were getting ready to go back and do another tour of Europe, and right before the tour of Europe, for, you know, whatever reason, Craig just wasn't going to do it. He couldn't do it, he wasn't going to do it, however that worked, and, and um, uh, we ended up going down to just a four-piece, just dropping a guitar player because Craig was replacing Jeff Boggs, and so... Um, you know, it was really, really kind of a hairy situation because he'd been promoted on the tour and all that stuff, and people were shocked not to see him, just like we were shocked for him not to be there. And um, it just, you know, one thing led to another. And we we hadn't officially started recording the album yet. We'd been just doing demos and writing and and um, you know things like that. And so when we got back, we did the actual recordings. Now the stuff that Craig worked on. Um, None of it made the album. It just wasn't as strong as what the other stuff was, but it ended up coming out later in 2013 on the Particles box set, which was uh, a song called If These Walls Could Talk. Uh, he, we had a version of Over You, which did make um, the Deadly Passions album, but Craig wasn't on that plane. It was in a di- and Plus, it was a different version that was recorded before we met Craig. And then we did a cover of To Live For The King, which was a... Carrie Livgren, Ryan James Dio off a Carrie Livgren album. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, it, it just didn't work out. I, you know, I don't know um, what the situation was, if there wasn't enough money for Craig or, or, or what the situation, you know, in his mind ended up being. But it didn't work out. We still talk. Uh, you know, everything's okay there as far as that point. But it was just a, a situation where, you know, we were approached by somebody, we agreed to do it, and then that same person that approached us ended up backing out, so, you know. Right. Wow. So, in 2010, you had Judgment, and in 2012, you had Private Sessions. You know, you know mm-hmm. that got to be a big accomplishment when you got bands that put out one album, and the next album's not for six or seven years after. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're definitely putting out a product that, that people want, on a constant basis, which I commend you for, because, you know, I don't want to hear, like, uh, Bombshell in, in 2005 and then 2012 here at Private Session. So it shows you're definitely doing, you know, a great job marketing the band and stuff like that. But you also do other stuff that, that uh, you know, I guess, it, you know, is... You know, a hobby or, or things you love. Like in 2014, you put out uh, uh, the Kiss tribute, uh, Hotter Than Hell. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Well, what I do um, for the majority of my time, when you know, whenever Hydrogen's not doing anything, we haven't we haven't actively toured as a band since 2011, just because there was some medical issues with Julie and and you know, it's just a, a cluster of reasons. And you know, people always got to think too that. You know, if you're in a band and you're out there and you're releasing albums and you're traveling, that you're making great money. Well, that's not necessarily true. Right. Um, you know, it's really hard. It's really expensive. Um, and so, you know, what I do in, in the meantime is I do a lot of production work and I do a lot of engineering. Uh, I have my own studio that we built on our property uh, out back of our house. A uh, really nice big studio. And I have people from all over the world, you know, where I've traveled and where we've traveled and, and done our thing. I've been able to meet a lot of people and, and have gotten a lot of work out of that. Um, so I have people coming, you know, from all over the world to come here and record. Uh, I've actually got a band starting today that's coming in from Pittsburgh. They had called Cognition that we're getting ready to start a full album. But, you know, so I do a lot of the production um, bands like Angels Revenge and, and Black Sun and another band that I play in, uh, Audio Porn. Um, you know, and, and to go on and on and on, there's a ton of names I'm not going to list them all. Um, but the Kiss thing, I've always been a huge Kiss fan. I've been a huge Kiss fan since the very first day that the first album came out. Bought that album in a Kmart in South Point, Ohio. I remember just like it was yesterday. Um, and then, you know, a few months later, the Hotter Hell album came out. And as a Kiss fan, even back then, because I was so into music, I guess, I just noticed that the album just didn't sound that great. Right. And I always loved the songs. And it's funny, as a kid, you know, you, you sit there and listen to the album, and I was always like, ah, man, I wish it sounded better. I wonder what's wrong. Um, 
And then a Kiss Live comes out, and then you hear something like watching you on a live versus Potter and Hell, and you're like, wow, that really sounds good. Right. And um, I always wanted to redo that album. I always wanted to re-record it. It's always been some of my favorite Kiss songs on that album. And so in 2014, I got a little break in the action from producing other people. Then I called up a bunch of my friends and said, look, here's what we're doing. We're not, we're not modernizing this album. We're going to sit down and we're going to copy the tones from the album and we're going to play it just like they played it. We're going to play it at the same tempos with the same everything. And we're going to put it out because I just want, I just, it was a personal thing. I just want to be able to listen to this album with a, with a modern sound, only modern sound in the terms of the clarity of it and, uh, you know, how clean it would be and how much more power it would have and, so we did that, and all the guys did a phenomenal job. Um, anybody who's listened to it has come back to me and told me, said, man, you guys just stayed dead true to that whole thing. That was the whole point. That's what I wanted to do. Right. And at the end, when it came time to figure out, well, we're going to put this out. How are we going to market it? So we came up with Hotter Than Hotter Than Hell. And I got Julie and some of her girlfriends together, threw some makeup on them, and, you know, took them into a photo studio, which I also have here on premise, and basically had them get in the in the formation of the Hotter Hell album cover and shot those pictures. Cool. So, um, you know, it was just a whole lot of fun, and I can tell you uh, that that whole lot of fun is going to lead to some other things that's going to be happening later on in this year. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a great album. I, I mean, you know, you sent me a copy of that, and it uh, really great production and stuff like that on that. Um, can you tell me also about uh, Godsology? Ah, Godsology. For those that don't know, there was, this, there was this little rock band from Texas. No, I'm just kidding. There was actually this little rock band from Columbus, Ohio, right. <laughs> back in wow. 1976, that they got together. Um, headed up by the infamous, and I do mean infamous, Eric Moore. Uh huh. Um, and they put out their first album, which was just called The Gods, and it became a big hit nationwide. I mean, the song Gotta Keep Her Running Off That, which is the hit off that album, has been in several movies and, and still gets played on the radio to this day. I, I got in the car the other day and, and turned on Ozzy's Boneyard on XM, and there it was. Right. Um, you know, and uh, they went on and released Nothing is Sacred, and and just all through the years, there was lineup changes, Eric going to jail, Eric getting out of jail, or reforming the band. Um, in 1987, he got with Freddie Salem uh, from the Outlaws, and they did a version of The Gods and released Mongolians, which is a phenomenal album. Um, and they just kept going and kept going. And, I don't know, 2010, 2011, I had the opportunity um, to meet up with Eric and his manager, John Gard. And we sat down and talked about a bunch of different stuff and all this, all this material that's piled up in front of us, you know, things that they wanted to do and Eric's just never been able to do it and, and this, that, and the other. So they made a trip down to the studio and we looked at all the stuff they had. And I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff that Eric has is, uh, recordings like board recordings and and self film stuff but they still eric wanted to get it out to the fans and so we've been working on you know doing that we ended up putting out godsology which was 1976 through 1980 right which was the original lineup era which was eric and glenn cataline and bob hill and mark chatfield and so what that consisted of is a six disc set five cds and a dvd um we remastered the first two albums. Had some. They had some board recordings, uh, some live shows from each one of those two, first two tours, and we went in and just you know all we could do is just try to master that and do the best you can, right? Um, and, and put those out. In the process, recorded a new album called Last Rites, and we went ahead and made it part of that box set too. And then the, from the reunion shows in 1995, when that lineup got back together, that was filmed on DVD, and so we put that, it wasn't filmed on DVD, it was just filmed, and we put it on DVD, so we put that in box set, and put it out as a six, you know, six disc set, and uh, that thing has ended up doing really, really great for the band, and, and the fans love it, and 
I can tell you right now that we're in the process of putting together Godsology 2, which is going to be 1981 through now. Cool, cool. Sounds like a great box set, too. Oh, it is great. I mean, I'll get you one out in the mail to you so you can see it. But, yeah, it, it, it's it's funny when you sit here and think about something, and here's here's this guy, you know, leader of this band, that has quietly been storing everything that's ever been done away in his house, and then when you bring it all out, it's kind of overwhelming. Very cool. <laughs> you know, Very cool. like, wow. Yeah. So tell me uh, the rest of 2015. What does uh, Hydrogen have planned or yourself? Well, there, there's a lot of things to be planned that are planned. You know, like today, I started production with Cognition. Really, really, really heavy band. I would consider them to be uh, Slipknot-ish, but heavier. Okay. Um, so we start production today at noon, actually, on this, on this date. Um, after that, there is going to be probably two hydrogen products this year. Uh, two new hydrogen products. There's going to be some other stuff come out, too. Uh, Joey and I are currently writing um, for a new album. Uh, there's going to be some other things that come out. There's going to be a re-release of the Strip and Blind Live album and tour. Um, and then there's also going to be an acoustic thing that we've started working on. So all that will be coming out this year. I've got audio porn in the studio starting in April. Um, and some other stuff that's going to be, you know, it's going to be working. My year's pretty much already lined up for me. I'm just going to have to go through on the calendar, like, you know, do like a prison term and just mark the days off. Oh. <laughs> like, you know, but there's, there's tons of stuff that's going on. Um, and then there's in March, we do tracking for a new tribute project, um, that, has a lot to do with the thing that we already talked about. I'm not going to let the whole cat out of the bag. Right. But, um, you know, just, there's just a bunch of cool stuff going on. So we're excited and, you know, and we stay real, real, real busy. And um, Julie right now is in the process of getting a photo shoot set up for the new album and, and, and all that stuff. And I wouldn't expect, I don't expect the new Hydrogen record to be out until probably late summer, maybe fall. Um, but the one good thing that's always true about us and something we always pay very close attention to is if you're a hydrogen fan and you've gone through and you've gotten all the albums, you really, you, you, you sit there and recognize, wow, man, every album that comes out sounds different. Right. You know, we don't, we make sure that we don't repeat for, you know, we're not a formula band. We don't, we don't repeat formulas. We don't, you know. This album sounds just like the last album. The songs sound kind of the same, the same formula. We don't do anything like that. So this album's going to be, you know, completely different. There was private sessions in 2012, and then Particles, the box set, came out in 2013. And 2014 had the EP Break the Chains, uh, you know, which was uh, different than private sessions. And now this album is going to be, I can tell you right now, this album's going to be very modern. Right. Cool. And, and, you know, so that's that's what we're doing and uh, just, you know, forever staying busy and doing our thing. Cool, cool, cool. Well, Jeff Westlake, thanks very much for the talk and congratulations on, uh, you know, all your ventures and stuff like that. And uh, say hi to Julie for me. And uh, would you like to say anything to the fans out there? Uh, just thanks to everybody who has supported us and, and who who likes the product and who have become fans and, um, you know, you can visit us at hydrogen.com. Just remember it's spelled G Y N and not G E N. Um, uh, you know, and, and just keep going to the website because there's going to be, there's going to be a new website rollout pretty soon and, and a bunch of other stuff. And, um, I've also got a solo album that's going to be coming out sometime in late 2015 that's being finished up now as we talk. And it's going to be under Westlake, the Westlake moniker. Um, so, you know, we just appreciate everyone, and we're, we stay excited to bring fresh music and stuff that people like to them, on, like you said before, on pretty much a yearly basis. So um, a big thanks to everyone because everybody out there does that, and including you, Brian, who, you know, has us on to do interviews. You guys are what keeps us doing it. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. No problem. We bye. appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.